It was my freshman year, I was 18 years old. I was enrolled in a psychology class in college that I had to get a science credit and just intro psychology and basically you had to, as a part of the class, be a part of some experiments that the graduate students would do so that they could get their dissertation done or their doctorate studies or whatever it was. So the class, you had to take your test in the class, but you also had to sign up for three hours of experimentation and if you didn't go to it, you failed the class, if I remember correctly in that. And when you would sign up for something, if you didn't show up for it, you would then get in trouble for not showing up for it. Now, you could send a replacement on your behalf, but somebody had to show up if you said you were going to come. So I was going through my freshman year, and one of my friends came up to me on a day, and he said, I, I, can, you go with, can you go for me to the psychology experiment? I can't go tonight. I've got another thing going on. I can't go. Can you go on my behalf? And I said, well, sure, I can go. No problem. i got to get credit anyway, so I might as well get it out of the way. So I showed up at the psychology experiment. I said, I'm here for a friend. They put my name down, and then I walked into the room, and it was about 100 guys in a kind of a theater setting type of a room, and they turned on a movie that we were going to watch a movie to see then get responsible at the end of how we felt after we had watched this movie and they turned on a pornographic movie. And I sat there as an 18-year-old freshman afraid that if I got up and left, would I fail the class? Would my friend fail the class? Would I actually put an F on his class because I was there for him? What should I do in this moment as the pornographic images rolled on the screens and I was just frozen. I just put my head down and I just would look up just to see if it was over every once in a while and just feeling shame and guilt and frozen. I need to leave, but I'm too scared to leave. I need to leave, but I'm not sure what will happen if I leave. And then the test came out or the form came out that you fill out the answers to find out your information. And the first question on it was, what is your religion? And you check a box on what your religion is. For the only time in my life, I checked the box other because I didn't want to check the box Christian. The shame that I felt that I would sit in there and not walk out and be watching that and participating in it, I didn't want anybody to know that a Christian was a part of that. And that gives illustration of this, that pornography brings great shame into a life. It makes us want to remove ourselves actually from the things of God instead of going towards the things of God. It pushes us deeper into the darkness. And it also shows this, that it's coming after you even when you're well-intentioned. I wasn't going to a magazine rack. I wasn't going to some store. I wasn't trying to get anything illicit. I was just trying to help out a friend. And it's coming at us in dynamic speed. And that's what we're going to talk about today is a tough thing so that we can guard our hearts. See, there's a great question that's asked, if you'll turn in your Bibles to Psalm 119, verse 9, a great question that's asked in this passage of Scripture. I also want you to get out your listening guide. This has got a ton of information on it. On the front, it's got all the things we're going to cover today. On the back, it's got resources of books and of articles and web pages and different things that you can look through. So every campus, if you'll get this and you'll pull this out and take notes, you need to keep this piece of paper for a long, long time. Sex is a gift from God, but it's been taken in a different way. See, Psalm 119 gives us this big question. Here's the big question of Psalm 119, verse 9. It says this, how can a young man keep his way pure? How can a young man or woman keep their way pure? That's what we're asking the question today. It's going to take us a ramp up to get to further verses in this passage. We'll get there, but I want you to just go with me in understanding what this is about. First of all, there's a few things that we need to remember. I've put them in your listening guide so that you can look over them. But here's a few things. Number one, pornography is rooted in the Greek word pornea. It's a Greek word pornea from which we get our word pornography. Well, what it means is to practice prostitution, sexual immorality, fornication. It's basically outside of the will of God, sexuality outside of the will of God, outside of the confines of marriage and honoring the Lord in that way. So pornography it comes from the Greek word pornea. Number two, both men and women are tempted in this subject. 
Both men and women are tempted in this subject. Now, men typically, not always, but typically, men usually are visual first and emotional second. Women are usually emotional first and visual second. Does that mean that women aren't visual? No. Does it mean that men aren't emotional? No. Just typically, that's how it works. So what happens is there are men and women tempted, even the pornographic, moving-making community. Ladies, they know you, and so they're interjecting romantic stories within the pornography movies now to be able to capture men and women. A study from six universities was done and 87% of men and 31% of young women were reported as using porn. It's a men pro man problem and a women's problem. Number three, every stumble is not an addiction. Every stumble is not an addiction. We need to hear that, parents. We need to hear that, just people in general. Every stumble is not an addiction. We don't need to just freak out, go, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. We need to be aware. We need to be concerned. We need to make sure it doesn't continue. But every stumble is not an addiction. But it quickly can become one. And number four, I want you to hear there is hope. I want to be hopeful and I want to be helpful today. I want to be hopeful and I want to be helpful. So whether you're on the internet watching the webcast, on the radio listening in, one of our campuses, whatever it is, we want to be hopeful and we want to be helpful. And I want you to know there is great help that can happen in our lives. Great help that can happen. But we are at a place of epidemic proportions with pornography. Epidemic proportions. 93% of boys and 62% of girls are exposed to internet pornography before the age of 18. 93% of boys, 62% of girls before the age of 18. The average age of the first internet pornography exposure is age 11. Some versions will say, or some studies will say 9, so it's from 9 to 11, the first exposure of internet pornography. Now, when I'm saying all these things, I'm not just talking about internet pornography, I'm talking about magazines, I'm talking about how the texts happen, I'm talking about clubs, anything outside of pornea, anything outside of the will of God. These things are going to be helpful. The porn industry is targeting our children. I want to give you a phrase that will hopefully shake you to the core. Our culture is determined to sexualize children. To sexualize children. What we have in our culture is the sexualization of children. You see it in the agendas that are put forward to try to make kids sexualized at a very early age. You see it here in internet pornography being seen at very early ages. You see the sexualization of children. And that breaks my heart that our kids at young ages are dealing with these things. The porn industry is a $13 billion industry a year. To give you a mindset of that, that is if you were to combine the NFL, the NBA, and Major League Baseball, pornography makes more money than those three sports combined. Pornography makes more money than NBC, ABC, and CBS combined. $13 billion. Each year there's 400 major motion pictures that come out and are created. Compare that to 11,000 pornographic films that come out. 400 to 11,000. And the University of Montreal did a, they attempted to conduct a research study comparing the psychological views of young men who had never watched porn with those that were regular users. Here's what the man said in trying to do this. He said, we started our research seeking men in their 20s who had never consumed pornography. Hear this. We couldn't find any. There was no focus group of 20-year-old males that it could be put together to say these had not participated in pornography. These had. Let's study the difference between the two. It's, they say it's as if it was that all of America smoked and we couldn't find any lung to compare to the smoker's lung. Every lung had been tainted by smoke. Everyone, they could not find a person to be a part of the study. It is of epidemic proportions so let's ask this question. How did we get here? Three ways we got here. Number one, affordability. Number two, accessibility. And number three, anonymity. Affordability, accessibility, and anonymity is what Morgan Bennett of Pepperdine University School of Law gives us. Affordability, it's free. You don't have to buy the movie. You don't have to buy the Magazine, you could just click around on the internet for free. Now, there's other things you can buy, of course, but there's free access that's there. Number two, there's accessibility. It used to be that you had to go to a, a smutty bookstore across town. 
And you had to park your car and hope nobody saw you and walk in and buy something in there and hope nobody found you in that place. Effort had to be put in. Now effort is replaced with ease and embarrassment is placed with pri- replaced with privacy. I heard one person say it like this, and I've done this before many times, is whenever you drive by an adult bookstore, just honk and wave at whoever it is walking in. Because <laughs> whoever it is walking in is going to go, who do I know that owns a car like that? Who do I know, Right? But the accessibility is not like that anymore. You don't have to be embarrassed anymore. It can be with great ease. It doesn't have to be hidden in the closet anymore. See, what's happened is magazines have turned to screens and pictures have turned into pixels. And now it's accessible and it's free and it's anonymous. It's anonymous. Nobody has to know. Nobody has to find out. Nobody will wave at you when you're going into the store. Nobody will see you. It is accessible. It's anonymous and it's affordable And what we have is we have a generation of students, of kids, or really of young adults as well, that have grown up as a digital native. They're digital natives. They prefer the internet to television. And they have always known how to operate devices and computers and phones. So that's why many of us, when you have a problem with your phone or your device, what do you do? You hand it to a kid, and they know how to fix it. But seeing that digital native is being preyed upon, And you have to move from being a digital native, if that's a description of you, to being a digital citizen, because what's coming at you is not all good, and it's not all what needs to happen. Porn is pursuing your family and mine. Porn is pursuing me and you. On the TV, on advertisements, on the internet, in texting, in chatting, in all whatever else that goes wider, it is coming after you. You don't even have to be looking for it. It's looking for you. Give you a funny illustration. You could Google best bakery in Houston. I just want to find the best bakery in Houston. Let me Google best bakery in Houston. You Google best bakery in Houston, and for a month, you'll get ads saying, looking for the cutest cupcakes in town, <laughs> looking for the hottest buns in Houston. That'll start popping up all over. You're not even looking for it. You're just trying to find a bakery, and all of a sudden, things start coming at you. And here's what the truth is about it. The truth is this. Pornography acts like a drug. Pornography acts like a drug. They're finding that the brains of people that are addicted to pornography look just alike of the brains that are addicted to cocaine and addicted to heroin. Pornography is a drug. The National Survey of Drug Use in America determined a few years back that there was about 2 million cocaine users in America. The Central Intelligence Agency determined that there was about 2 million heroin users in the United States. Compare that to the 40 million regular online pornography users in the United States. 2 million on cocaine, 2 million on heroin, 40 million on internet pornography. And they're finding that the pornography to the human brain is just as potent, if not so, more than the addictive chemical substances as cocaine and heroin. Let me show you a quote. I'm going to put it on the screen behind me. It's a statement of a man uh, named Jeffrey Santnover, who's a psychiatrist, a psychoanalyst, and a former fellow in psychiatry at Yale, that he's given this statement before Congress. This is not a pastor. This is a, a psychiatrist from Yale before Congress. Here's what he says. With the advent of the computer, the delivery system for this addictive stimulus has become nearly resistance-free. It's accessible. It is as though we have devised a form of heroin 100 times more powerful than before, usable in the privacy of your own home, anonymity, in the privacy of one's own home, and injected directly into the brain through the eyes. It is now available in unlimited supply via a self-replicating distribution network. That's the internet, basically. Glorified as art and protected as free speech. Do you hear the alarm bell sound of a drug a hundred more times, in his view, more potent than heroin? What we have done is we have basically said in our homes, the syringe or the computer, and we've laid them before and said, student, take them to your room. Pornography is as addictive as a drug. And that's why you can't just say, I'm going to stop tomorrow. I'm going to stop tomorrow. Oh, if I just read another book, if I just go to another church service, now hopefully, and we're praying big that God would break people free today, no question about it. 
but it is also a brain issue as well as a moral and spiritual issue. It is a brain issue as well as a moral and spiritual issue. We're going to get to the, to the spiritual part and the moral part in just a second. But I want to teach you about the brain. What's going on in your brain? Here's what's going on in your brain. It's the same things Dr. Valerie Voon from Cambridge University, a neurophysicist, neuropsychiatrist, says this. That recently it was shown that men who describe themselves as addicted to porn, which means that they've lost relationships because of it, develop changes in the same brain area, the reward center, that changes in drug addicts. Pornography acts like a drug in your brain. Here's what happens in your brain. Your brain is, has what's called neuroplasticity. Neuroplasticity is the fact that your brain is able to change different paths that it takes. So it can move in different fashions. Think of it like a, like a trail into the woods. The more you walk that trail, the more you take that trail, right? It becomes beaten down, and it becomes a trail that you take. Same thing can happen in our brains. So what happens is, some of us, it's worry. Whatever happens, we go down the neuroplasticity, we go down worry. Doesn't matter what it is, we're going to worry about it. Some of us, it's anger. We're going to hit that, and we're going to go down that trail. We're going to be mad about something. Some of us, it's fear, and we have made these channels, these trails in our brain. Now, here's the good news about neuroplasticity. Your brain can be changed. You can rewire different paths. You can think differently. You can move different places. But here's what happens in your brain. There's what's called the reward center. And when you see a pornographic image, your reward center gives a shot of dopamine into your brain. Now, your reward center in your brain is intended that when you do something and you accomplish something, you go, yeah, that felt good. After a good hard day's work, yeah, that felt good. It's because the reward center blessed the work, if you will, and honored the work and rewarded you with a shot of dopamine in your brain. Well, what happens with porn addiction is you get the reward without the work. You don't have the work of courtship. You don't have the work of conversation. You don't have the work of marital faithfulness. You don't have the work of marital fighting, of getting through something. You haven't shared your lives. You're just sharing your body. And the way that it's supposed to happen is you share your lives. And now when you share your lives, then you share your body. But the brain is getting from the reward center dopamine for no work. So it needs more. It begins to crave it. So there's got to be another image, another click, another chat, another text, another movie, another this, another that. It grows and it begins to be an insatiable appetite. It needs more and more and more and more and more and more and more. So it can become more and more perverted and perverted and perverted and perverted. So you go, well, how did this happen? It's because there's a reward without the work, and so the dopamine is firing, and now your neuroplasticity has formed a trail in your brain that this is the route it's going to follow, and your brain begins to crave the dopamine, which then requires the pornography. See, a lot of times the pornography is not even about sex. It's about release. It's about relief. It's about stress release. It's about escape. But the mind begins to be functioning and working in that path. And therefore, as the images you need more and more and more, watch what happens. Reality no longer satisfies. And truth be known, fantasy doesn't satisfy either because you need more and more and more of it. Reality doesn't satisfy. Have you noticed that about every other commercial in a football game is Viagra or Cialis? Now, not in all cases, but in some cases, that's because pornography has made sex unsatisfying in reality. The fantasy is greater than the sex in real life so that there needs to be drugs to have arousal to happen so that sex can be had. Now, let's ask this question. If this is just a brain thing, if we don't, we're not in an evolutionary thought church by any means, but we do live in an evolutionary thought society. If this is just a chemical reaction in the brain from willing people that want to be in these movies and these images to willing people that want to participate in free speech and art, quote unquote, why is it wrong? Why is it wrong? It's just chemical reaction of an evolutionary mind to people wanting to do this and wanting to do that. Why is it wrong? Let me give you three reasons why it's wrong. And you know what's interesting? No one thinks it's right. No one's like, man, I just, I hope my teenager gets into porn. Man, I tell you what would really bless our marriage if my wife started surfing the internet watching porn pornographic movies. Nobody thinks it's right. So why is it wrong? Here's what it is. Three quick reasons. Number one, people are seen as objects instead of created in God's image. They're seen in, uh, as objects instead of created in God's image. That is someone's mom in that video. 
That is someone's daughter or granddaughter in that video. That is someone's wife, possibly. Husband, son, grandson. Those are real people that those images are coming forward. And let me tell you about those real people. Those real people are tremendously emotionally wounded and mentally bent. You're watching mentally bent and emotionally wounded people fall further and further into the pit that they're in. People are not objects. They are made in God's image. And can I just say to the men, men, listen to me. Women were made to be protected by men, not used by men. They were made to be protected by men, not used by men. And when sex becomes an object, instead of seeing someone as God's image and his creation and someone's daughter and mom and your wife, it's using them instead of protecting them. Number two, it's wrong because this is not a victimless industry. This is not a victimless industry. Now, they'll make you think that. There's no victims. Everybody's a willing participant in this. This is not a victimless industry. You know why it's not a victimless industry? Because it promotes and it finances trafficking, abuse, and prostitution. It promotes and finances trafficking, abuse of children also, and prostitution of children also. See, trafficking in our city, do you know that there's, there's 50,000, some statistics would say, 50,000 people trafficked in the United States? Out of that 50,000, 20,000 are trafficked in Houston. The I-10 corridor, which is about, what, 200 yards to my left here at the, youth, at the Loop campus? You could go to the edge of our parking lot and you could take a baseball and you could throw it and it could land on I-10. It's one of the main trafficking corridors of our nation. Let me just chill you with something I've been thinking about all week. It is if we are a church next to the railroad tracks heading to Auschwitz. We cannot just sing songs. Our church is actively involved, financially involved. Our volunteers are involved. If you're interested at all in helping to prevent trafficking, talk to our missions department. We are helping to, to be leaders in an alliance of numerous churches of going forward. We do not want to sit by the railroad tracks of Auschwitz and sing pretty songs. We want God to use us. He's placed us for a reason. And this is promoting trafficking, prostitution, and abuse. Number three, it destroys families and lives. It destroys families and lives. Adultery increases by 300% when pornography is involved. It changes the expectations of sex. I mean, how could any spouse measure up to what's some fantasy on a screen? It changes the expectations within sex. It makes sex a selfish thing instead of a beautiful God-given thing of sharing our bodies because we're sharing our lives. It makes sex a selfish thing. How can you meet my needs? How can you meet my fantasies instead of a sharing that comes together of the shared lives in marriage? And by the way, married couples watching pornography to spark intimacy is detrimental and eroding to the marriage. This is unquestionably something that is not right and is not best for us. So now let's ask the question, how do we break free? How do we break free from this? What is it that we need to do? How do we break free? I want you to look at Psalm 119 again, verse 9. Asking this huge question that's out there for us. How can a young man keep his way pure? By keeping your word I have sought you with all of my heart. Don't let me wander from your commands. I have treasured your word in my heart. Why? So that I may not sin against you. The way that we keep our ways pure is what we talked about last week as well. As we did Psalm 119 verses 1 through 8, getting ready for this message today. Our head, our heart, our hands. You remember that? I want you to do that with me. Everybody, all campuses. Head, heart, hands. Again, Head, heart, hands. We're going to talk about that again. I'm going to change the heart to be the final one because I want us to end with our hearts. Our heads, we have to renew and rewire our minds. The neuroplasticity has got to be about the things of God. 
It's got to be about the things of God. Now, this is good news that our minds can change. Romans 12, verse 2 says, Do not be conformed to this age, but transformed, how? By the renewing of your mind. Why? So that you may discern what is good, pleasing, and the perfect will of God. So our heads, we've got to renew and rewire our minds. You don't just say no, you got to say yes to Jesus. Say yes to the things of God. Now let me give you how we do this. Here's how we can do this. We remove and we replace. We remove and we replace. We're going to see a scripture in just a second that gives us a verse of scripture saying flee youthful passions, remove and pursue righteousness and holiness and all of these different things. So we remove and we replace. Now the neuroplasticity, we get off this trail through the woods and we go on this other trail through the woods so that we can make our minds, when we see that image, instead of going towards it, we go away from it. Now here's what it says in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 22. Now this is really easy to remember because it's all the twos in Timothy, okay? So you can think of it like this, Timothy 2. Timothy too, Timothy also. Even Timothy would struggle with youthful passions. Even Timothy struggled with lust. So all the twos in Timothy. Second Timothy, second chapter, 22nd verse. Here's what it says. It says this. Flee from youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Flee from youthful passions. You see, we're moving that. And pursue which means go after, we're going to pursue it, we're going to replace youthful passions along with all who call, uh, or pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with all of those who call upon the Lord from a pure heart. Pursue God and flee the immorality. Now, it's interesting that it says there youthful passions or youthful lusts. Now, all of us, as I said in the beginning, men and women, all generations, we all struggle with temptation, with lust and sexuality, no question about it. But in particular, it says youthful lust. Here's what I want to bring out to you. Different generations have different temptations. Different generations have different temptations. So what you struggle with at 14, you might not struggle with at 54. What you struggle with at 34, you might not struggle with at 64. There's going to be a struggle all the way through of all different things. But it's just different. It's just a little bit different. Students, as your body changes, your curiosity is going to change. And as your curiosity changes, you're going to wonder, well, what about that? Well, how does that happen? What's going on with that? And I want you to hear this. Go to your parents as the resource. Go to your parents as the resource or a trusted friend. If your parents, you know, if that's not going to work for you or for whatever reason, go to your parents. Parents, I want to go to you this. We got to speak loud, early, and often. Loud, early, and often. If you're like, well, we're going to have the talk. You don't have the talk. You have a million talks is what you have. And if you think, well, we probably ought to do that, you're already too late. You're probably already too late. Tell them everything. And what goes over their head goes over their head, and what they needed, they'll take. And you just keep being, you can come to me for anything. I will tell you anything and everything. And what will happen is you've got to flee those youthful lusts, and we've got to help them, parents, to be able to do that. So I want to say in particular to students, particular to young adults, to flee, to look out. Does that mean that adults, uh, older adults, and everybody doesn't struggle with this? No, everybody's got sexual temptation. I'm just saying that different generations have different levels of temptations. And you are in a hormonal hurricane right now, student and young adult. You're going to have the craziest of thoughts. And what will happen with the sexualization of children, the culture will force you to act upon and decide upon those thoughts. And I'm telling you in the midst of a uh, hormonal hurricane that it is crazy thoughts that you're going to have at different times. And we all have them. We all have them. Flee and pursue the things of God. Now let me give you a funny story out of our own home. I have a teenage son, and so we've been talking about all sorts of stuff, and so I was kind of preparing him for being a teenager, and I wanted to talk to him about drugs and about alcohol, and this is what I said to him. I said, hey, let's talk for just a minute. He said, okay, and so I said, people are going to offer you as a teenager, as you're getting older, people are going to offer you drugs, and people are going to offer you alcohol. You're going to show up at a party, somebody's going to have drugs, somebody's going to have alcohol, and always call us. We'll always come pick you up, but that's going to happen. Here's what I want you to do. When they offer you drugs or alcohol, I want you to politely look them in the eye and politely say, no, thank you, and turn and walk away. And he said, well, that's not what mom said I should say. <laughs> I said, really, what did, what did mom say that you should say? He said, mom said I should look him in the eye and say, hell no. <laughs> and 
turn and walk away. <laughs> so I turned to my wife. She was sweeping in the kitchen. She goes, well, it is saying no to hell. <laughs> and it is saying no to hell. Here's the deal. Students, you're going to be offered drink, you're going to be offered drugs, you're going to be offered pornography. Somebody's going to say, hey, come look at this image. Have you seen this? And I want you to quote your pastor's wife. <laughs> and look them in the eye and say, hell no. And turn and walk away. <laughs> That's the kind of heart we got to fight, right? Right? That's the kind of heart we're fighting for. I'm not trying to cuss. You know that. I'm just saying that's the venom in our hearts that we got to say, no, I am saying no to hell, and I am not going that path because I don't want any type of reward without work. I want to replace. I want to rewire. I want to flee so that I can be free in Jesus and pursue the things of God. And that comes from our heads of a decision and a walking out. And if you got to lose friends over it, students, you lose them. You didn't need those kind of friends anyway. And you walk out. That's our heads. But we also got it with our hands. There's got to be some practical steps with our hands to create a protection plan. To be able to say, you know what? We're going to have protection. We've got to actively do so. We can't just say that we're going to do this in our mind. We can't just pray, 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 pray. Although, of course, you know I'm for prayer. There's got to be some active accountability that walks through. I want to draw your attention to the back of your, your weekly guide or your listening guide that you have here. We have down there a seven-step family plan. You can make it your own if you don't have a family. Tony Bianco, our middle school minister at the Loop Campus, put this together. And I just want you to see this. I'm going to hit a couple things, but I want you to see there's a lot of resources on the back of this piece of paper. Even more, if you go to our website, houstonsfirst.org slash pornography, we have twice as many resources on the website as what we have on this sheet of paper. We couldn't fit it all. So here's what I want you to hear with your hands. You got to have a plan. You got to have a plan. It said in verse 9, how can a young man keep his way pure or a young woman or an old woman, old man, by keeping your word? How do we keep his word? Here we go. Verse 1. Or it's verse 1. It's not verse 1. Number 1. We is stronger than me. We is stronger than me. You need accountability. You need a team. You need people around you encouraging the right Friday night friends, students, not the wrong Friday night friends. Eat lunch with whoever you want, but choose your Friday night friends really carefully. And to be able to say the we is stronger than the me, bring it to the light, confess, have accountability. And here's the truth about it. Some of you are going to have to have a really tough confession in the next 24 hours. And I'm going to encourage you to do it and to bring it to the light because what shame will do is keep pushing you further and further into the darkness. Bring it to the light. Repent. Be remorseful. Lay it out. Say, I am sorry. It's not who I want to be. And the we will be stronger than the me of the individual. That's why the Word of God talks about fellowship so much and the church and being a part of a body of believers because we is stronger than me. Number two, connect instead of click. Connect instead of click, especially digital native generations. Spend time with people. We say it in our house like this, always choose relationships over screens. Always choose relationships over screens. Be with people. And spend that time with people. Spend time with God. Spend time with your spouse. Spend time with your parents. Spend time with your friends. Spend time with your coworkers. Whatever it is. Spend time with people instead of just clicking. The more we just click, the less we connect. We've really lost the ability to connect with people in our society. So we don't know how to talk to a girl, so we'll just watch a girl. We don't know how to talk to a guy, so we'll just watch a guy. Connect instead of click. Number three, develop a technology plan. I told you about Tony's resource there on the back. Develop a technology plan. A couple examples. Have filters on your computers and your devices, your phones. Have a public charging station where all the phones go at night. Students, don't take your room in, uh, don't take your devices into your room. Your parents, you're going to have to discuss this. Either ever, that's one option. After dark is another option. After a certain time at night is another option. But don't ever leave it overnight in there. You might need to buy what's called in the 80s an alarm clock to wake up. Because you use your phone to wake up. Don't do that. You need to get out of that habit of having your phone there to wake you up. Find a different way to listen to music. Get that out of your room. I pulled up our, our phones. We have all iPhones in our family, and I started looking, just you know, thinking about all this stuff. The default is for the maturest of images, the maturest of movies, the maturest of TV. Siri is default to explicit language. 
That's the default. Apple, can you help us out? Make the default PG. Well, we got to choose. But that's not what the industry wants, does it? So I changed it all up, and passwords nobody knows, and on it goes. You can actually remove the web browser from your student's phone. All they need is talk and text, and they can still get apps. So those can happen. Parent cheering over to the left. There you go. Okay. I feel your support. I feel your support. And students, that's not because we don't trust you. We don't trust everybody else that's coming at you. And we don't trust you. Because <laughs> we don't trust us, right? I mean, it all trickles down. Develop a technology plan. Find the deal and be assaulting at it. Number four, know your triggers. When are you most vulnerable? Is it late at night? Is it early in the morning? Is it when you're hungry, angry, lonely, or tired that you need to halt? Hungry, angry, lonely, tired? What is it that is your trigger? What gets you thinking down that path? We all know it, don't we? We see something, we go, oh, I wonder what that is. And we know what that is. But we begin to play with that thought. Let's assault it. Luke chapter 4, verse 13, it said, when the devil had finished all of his tempting of Jesus in the wilderness, listen, it says, and he left him, being Jesus, the devil left Jesus until an opportune time. There are opportune times, and you have to know your triggers and understand that. And if you're still not victorious after this, those things, which I'm not saying they're the end-all, be-all of everything, I'm just saying, if you're still not victorious, talk with a counselor, be a part of Celebrate Recovery. We put our counseling phone number there. If you're listening on the radio, it's 713-335-6462. Go to our website, get involved in our counseling ministry, our Celebrate Recovery, whatever it is. You let God do his work through a whole nother level of need as you begin to change the neuroplasticity of your head and get the things right of your hands. But let's don't forget about the heart either. The heart either. I come to you sharing these things, and I hope you haven't felt a beat down in the least. I come with a broken heart because it's ripping us all apart. It's ripping homes apart. It's ripping people apart. Let's look again, and I want you to look for the heart in Psalm 119, verse 9 through 11. How can a young man keep his way pure? Great question. That's our question. That's what we're asking today. How? How? By keeping your word, okay? I have sought you, God. I have sought you with all my heart. Do not let me wander from your commands. I have treasured your word in my heart. Why? So that I may not sin against you. Look down to verse 14. I rejoice in the way you revealed by your decrees as much as in all riches. So here he's saying that I want the heart. I want the heart. And here's the the statement, our heart. Trust the grace of Jesus and your identity in Christ. Trust the grace of Jesus. That's what we gotta trust in. It's our head, it's our hands, it's our heart. And we've got to trust in the grace of Jesus Christ. That's your blank there. Trust the grace of Jesus. And I've put these three phrases together for you that I, I've thought about these phrases. These phrases are rich with meaning. They're huge with meaning. I could preach a sermon on every one of them, but I want you to hear your heart. I know it's, also a brain thing. I get that. I just taught you that. I know it's a head thing and a hand thing, but I also know it's a heart thing for the person that's a believer in Christ and the person that needs to become a Christian and trust Jesus as Savior. Here's my three things I want you to hear. In verse 14, it talked about that it was like the riches that we desire his word. And Jesus, the word became flesh, like the riches. This is my riches. And here's what it is. Number one, flee shame and run to the Savior. Flee shame and run to the Savior. Jesus Christ, see, shame pushes you further and further in the darkness. Running to the Savior brings you to the light. Listen to 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 through 11, about the change that can be made when we run to Jesus. Verse 9, do you not know that the unjust will not inherit God's kingdom? Do not be deceived, sexually immoral people, idolaters, adulterers, male prostitutes, homosexuals, thieves, greedy people, drunkards, revilers, or swindlers will not inherit God's kingdom. But here's the good news in verse 11. But some of you were, past tense, 
like this. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by the Spirit of our God. So we run from shame to the Savior. That's what some of you were, but the blood of Jesus in salvation, yes, is what it's speaking of, but also in, in, in a redemption of, of, a, of, a, of a believer and refreshment of being able to re-give our, uh, rededicate our lives to the Lord to get our hearts back right with Him. So it's for the believer and for the lost. Number two, come from condemnation to the kindness of God. Lay down the stick that you're beating yourself up with. Lay down the stick you're beating up your family with. And come from condemnation to the kindness of God. Romans 2 verse 4 says, and the kindness of God is what leads us to repentance. Romans chapter 8 verse 1 says, for there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Is there conviction? Yes. Is it wrong? It is. Is it sin? Of course. Is it something that should be out of your life? Yes. But don't let condemnation keep you in the dark. Let condemnation be drawn out and be trumped by kindness of God. God loves you, hear me. God loves you, he loves you, he loves you. He's with you on every click. And he loves you. Is he pleased with that? No, he's not. But does he love you? Yes, he does. In the heart, come from condemnation to the kindness of God. Of God. Third and finally, step out of fear to forgiveness. Step out of fear to forgiveness. What does sin bring? Sin brings fear, doesn't it? I don't want anybody to know. I want to keep it anonymous. And what if they find out? What are they going to think? Step out of fear into forgiveness. That's in the light is where forgiveness is. In the dark is where fear is. Step back into the light with Jesus. And let the forgiveness of Christ come over you. There is not a person, be it male or female, old or young, that does not know the surge of lust in their body. There's not a person, male or female, old or young, married or single, that does not know the temptation of letting their mind to go to a place sexually that's not where it should go. Everyone knows that. And everyone has failed in that. But Jesus... Here's the good news. Jesus lived a life of purity that you and I couldn't live. And so we got to hitch our wagon to Jesus. Not to our willpower, not to our strength, not to some sermon. Hitch our wagon to Jesus. I'm placing my faith and my trust in salvation of Christ, in Christ. I'm a believer and I'm trusting Jesus. I need you to be your purity through me. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. For he who knew no sin became sin on my behalf that I could become the righteousness of God. Step out of fear into forgiveness, and that's the gospel. That's the good news. It's not up to you. It's up to him. And place your trust and faith in him as believer or as unbeliever in salvation, coming to know him as Savior. Place it in him, and God will then rewire your head. He'll give you strength in your hands, and he'll fill your heart. As you cherish his word, how can a young man keep his way pure? An old man or a young woman or an old woman? Because I've kept your word and I've treasured it like the riches of all riches. Do you need counseling? Possibly so. Is there some other aspects? Yes. But we've been praying that Jesus would set free lives in the heart of what God wants to do. I want to close with this. I received all sorts of emails this week, and I appreciate your prayers. Part of us being a new you, this series of last week, how do we spend time with God, leads right into this of how do we find victory over pornography. Listen to this email. Sexual addiction has ripped my marriage apart three years ago this month. It took my husband and I to the depths that I had never experienced before. It stole the joy of the first two years of marriage. It stole my trust in him, my trust in myself, and my ability to function day to day. Today, after trusting God when everyone else was telling me I could walk away. Years in couples therapy, individual therapy, Celebrate Recovery, our independent 12-step programs as well. I am grateful for God's redemption in our marriage. 
We are in a place that I believe would not have been possible if it were not for God bringing this to light and to the encouragement we found to those in our community. See, we is bigger than me. So many marriages I know don't make it because of the hope that Satan is robbing us of. My marriage, here last sentence, my marriage is living proof that when we put our faith in God, he can do more than we could ever ask or imagine. So I want you to hear me say, if you're afraid to check that box, Christian, because of the shame in your life, I want you to hear me say, you hold on to that box, Christian, like you never have before. And who Jesus is and who Christ is in you as a believer. You come to Christ as a believer and you grab and you cling after every fall. You cling to that box, Christian, and know that is your strength and that is your hope. And parents, we must be vigilant. Students, you must be humble if we're going to make it through this without it ripping our souls apart. Because they're coming after you and your home. It is not a joke. It is real. And we need Jesus. We need our head, in our heart, and in our hands. Father, we come in Jesus' name. And by your strength alone, and we're praying, God, that you would break chains. I'm asking for the Holy Spirit to do things. I can't just do it with a sermon, Lord. It's not enough, Lord. I'm asking in Jesus' name, whether somebody's listening to this on CD or webcast or six months away from when I preached it or right now or the radio, whatever. Lord God Almighty, would you wake us up and break the chains, Father? Would you renew our minds so that we could discern what is good and pleasing and right in your perfect will? How can we keep our way pure, Father? through your word, your son, your spirit, you as father. You're a good father, Lord. And this is not a gift from you. Sex is a gift from you within marriage. That is a gift from God. But Lord, it's been taken and it's been perverted and it's ripping us apart. Jesus, God Almighty. Speak to us. Heal us. Restore us. May we leave miraculously different. Give us new desires for you. Change our minds and our hearts and our hands. In Jesus' name.